They are, uh, they are, they operate like many media companies, I and mean, we would call them blogs, you know, four years ago. But they're not always blogs. They're they're disruptors. They're everyone from the business insiders to um, to players like you know to lose it, for example, which is a weight loss app that became a website and became a book. Um, so they're mobile first media to group on in some ways maybe. Um, but they're disruptors that are kind of like you know niche, but uh, but you, but interesting kind of how they're changing the landscape. The third is um, you know we uh, we see corporate media, corporate slash brand media. We believe that every company can be a media company if they want to be. That could be done through curation. It's not easy. It's hard if you want to do it, but it's an opportunity. And then the last piece, which is kind of connective tissue, is social. So social now is only 25% of my focus. I'm kind of thinking about that entire system and how we activate subject matter experts across all that. And I think that that's equally for media companies. They need to be thinking across those four and you know, we'll see them. We'll see them buying and merging. I mean, I think Daily Beast merging with Newsweek is an example of that. They they found a disruptor and they merged. Um, you know, uh, editors and uh, and thought leaders and, and columnists, arguably, are the you know have hold a lot of the cards in media companies. So we think the media is back bigger than ever, and we need to think about what we're, you know about how we tell stories across those four spheres in a way that promotes our, our subject matter experts. And that's what we're kind of seeing as the, the outcome of trust, because if we don't elevate people, we're going to get lost in all the stuff that's out there, no matter how good it is. Content's just going to get lost every day. Um, so I think that trust is one of the most fantastic examples of online to offline behavior, right? And the best way I can give this example is um, I, ever since I was a child, my very first word was the word taxi. I'm very, very good at getting taxis. I take taxis everywhere. I'm very proud of taking taxis everywhere. And one of the great things about being a Brit in New York City is, other than having an accent that people trust, um, is, is you know, figuring out, or maybe not, uh, is figuring out which way the avenues go. And it's very common that you know, most people looking for a taxi are going in the same direction. You're either going north, you're going south, you're going east, or you're going west. And since I got here 12 years ago, I would sprint across four lanes of traffic, get into a taxi, turn around, and I would see some poor old lady who had three kids in her arms and a couple of bags, and I'd say, sorry, you know, and in that off I would go. And I'd feel very, very guilty, but that is the New York way, right? Survival of the fittest, take your taxi, it's raining, keep going. About six months into this, I figured out that this wasn't who I was. So I, when I would get to the taxi before everybody else, I'd say, would you like to share it? Right? Do you want to share a taxi? We'll probably go in the same direction. I'll even pay for it. And they would look at me and they would just think, this guy's going to mug me, right? They would just look terrified. And I can say that over, I continue to do this, and literally it was maybe one out of 10, one out of 20 people would do it. And I can say over the last like three or four years, nearly everybody says yes, no matter who it is. We always share a cab. And it's fabulous. I love it. I mean, I meet new people. I've even done business. It's, it's been great. It's, it's been a wonderful experience. And plus, you get to share, share the, uh, the cab fare if, if you want to. And it's, in a way, it's a very antithetical thing that we think about. Like when immediately when we think, you know, if you want to meet a stranger, do you want to spend time in that space with somebody you don't know, we sort of think no. But then when they actually do it, it's, it's a very rewarding thing. And I think that comes from social networks. And that comes from the confidence of sharing and selling our products online, of sharing services, meeting people. And I think that's what's really exciting, is that we are becoming a more trusting society again. And in France in particular, this is really sort of propelled to people actually lending each other's cars. We've zip car is the old model, we've moved into the new model where if I have a car, I will directly lend it to a stranger, right? And that, that is really, as, as much technology as you have, as much verification is, is based on good old community trust. And, and in a funny way, the online presence and the, where it's going is creating the sense that it's safe to be more trusting again. I think it's a very positive thing. Do you, are you afraid you're gonna get mugged when you share the when you share the cab? This is New York. I mean, you just want to. I know you're you know you're Brit, I assume, you know. But I mean, you, do, you know that's great. But you know, you realize that you know we um, about 300 years ago we kind of like you know we got rid of you guys, and uh, and uh, and you know. But are you afraid there might be some residual kind of like you know feelings about that? No, I I, I, don't, I haven't been mugged yet. You know, there's still there's still time. Other thoughts, questions in the back? There's a couple of hands. You got a long way to go.
stretching the notion of a brand to the, to the breaking point? Um, no, I, I think that uh, the great brands will prevail. I mean, the, the, but ultimately there might be a um, there might be a certain number of brands you can hold in your head at any given time. But I think branding is is, is more critical than ever. And if you think about you know Google and, and Apple and tech brands, I mean they they in their own different ways they built amazing brands. And Facebook has built an amazing brand. If I think of See, it's interesting. I, th I think that if you, it, we actually see it the other way, that actually that, uh, that the tech brands are most trusted in our data. And the other thing that also happens is that as they start to collect more data on you, they make that experience more personalized. So you might, you, uh, I'm sure there's plenty of people that are out there like you, but my feeling is that, that the more they collect data and they personalize the experience for you and they make it relevant, and that's, and that's Google's challenge right now, um, they'll, they'll reinforce themselves as being kind of a, a force to be reckoned with. Now, and I, and I give them both credit for, for shaking things up constantly. But do you have a different opinion? And do you agree? I, I agree. I mean, I, I agree with him. Maybe. Well, I would, say, I would say a couple of different things. I would say that um, when I get a CV now with Harvard Business School or LSE where I went, it doesn't mean anything to me anymore. And the reason it doesn't mean anything is that some of the best brands and some of the best businesses come from entrepreneurs who just see a very fundamental, simple need. So in the way you are all sort of brands, you all have the ability to create brands and the best way to do that is to observe a need and to solve that online. It's cheaper than ever before. It's more accessible than ever before. So I do believe that uh, the sort of um, uh, ability for big brands to be protected from small startups is actually disappearing as we go along because the barriers are less. Having said that, um, I do also think that you know, brands like Google are protected. There are actually better search engines out there. They just can't get going because Google is so dominant. They either buy it or they kill it. Right? Um, so I think you know, brands are still very, very, very relevant. 